Okay. Okay, thanks. Good morning. Uh, uh, last time we were going over the basic properties of viruses as an, an introduction, so that I hope you've got a good feel for them as we start to go into details. I'm trying to give you the overview at the moment. And we were talking about the overview of the virus life cycle, and we got to talking about how they absorb to the surface of the cells. Uh, before I go on any further, were there any questions on the stuff I talked about, structure and classification? Okay. Uh, so we talked about how they absorb to cells, and we said the outermost surface of a virus has an attachment protein in it, and that will be on the nuclear capsid if it's an unenveloped virus, or if it's an enveloped virus, it will be inserted in the lipid membrane. It's a lipid bilayer membrane, just like our plasma membrane, or ER, because that's what it's derived from. Uh, but it has a viral protein in that recognizes the receptor on the host cell surface, which can be anything, carbohydrate, lipid, protein, a mixture. Uh, this interaction is a non-covalent interaction. It's temperature independent. It doesn't require any energy. No ATP or anything like that is required. But it does require the viral attachment protein, and it does require the cellular receptors. So the viruses bind to something on the cell surface. It may be something that's on the present, uh, present on a huge number of cells, or it may be something that's only present on a very few cells in the body, in which case the virus will be highly targeted to a particular tissue, or in some cases to a particular animal if they're very, they're, their receptor is something that is very specific. So this determines a lot of the host range specificity of the virus. But there's many other things that are involved as well. So that gets the virus attached to the cell surface, but somehow it has to actually get into the cell, into the cytoplasm, so that it can start doing its thing. Uh, and so that step of actually getting into the cytoplasm of the cell is called penetration, and that's the next cell, step after binding to the attachment protein. And I'll start off by talking about the enveloped viruses, those that have got these lipid bilayer membranes around them. And what happens is they basically get into the cytoplasm by some form of membrane fusion. And I'm going to try and show you that diagrammatically. Um, and I'm going to start off first about talking those that about those that fuse directly with the plasma membrane. So here, here we have the cell. This blue stuff indicates cytoplasm. Here's the host cell uh, receptor, whatever it's made of. The virus comes in diffuses around because it doesn't know where it's going, uh, eventually meets some of these host cell receptors, binds to them, and then frequently um, other things come in and, and help that binding become more stable. And you'll be hearing about some of that um, from Richard Hunt when he talks to you about HIV. Uh, so these come in, they bind, and then this association becomes much more intimate due to the, the properties of the protein's involved in the host cell plasma membrane and in the virus. Uh, and what happens is these two membranes come in very close opposition to each other. And they will actually fuse, and that means that if you can try and imagine it in three dimensions, which is difficult, but if this turquoise membrane, which is the viral one, fuses with the host cell plasma membrane, which is the dark blue one, uh, what you will now is have a continuum where this dark blue one comes continuous with the viral membrane and then continuous back with the host cell membrane on the other side, which is what I've tried to show here. So this step is called membrane fusion. And now the cytoplasm and the inside of the virus particle are in continuum with each other. And if I were to take this particular uh, construct here, this right-hand picture here, if I could take the left-hand side and the right-hand side and pull it, this turquoise membrane would then become continuous with this membrane as a single linear thing like this. So that's just what would happen if you just pulled these two parts out. Uh, and you can see this basically delivers the nuclear capsid to the cytoplasm. Very easy way to get into the cell. And you'd think most viruses with envelopes would use it, but in fact, a relatively few do. And that's because there are quite a few consequences, some of which will come to discuss in some later uh, lectures. But one obvious consequence you can see here is this virus has only just infected the cell and it's already left a signal in the cell surface that this cell is infected because it's left a viral protein in it. 
So it, it's maybe not as stealth as you might think would be a good idea, uh, but there are some other reasons why this is not maybe such a good idea, and we'll come across to some of those later. So anyway, a lot, some viruses do use this route, and they just fuse directly. Uh, and the viruses that do that, and you'll see why I keep grouping them together as we go through the, the rest of these lectures, are herpes viruses, paramyxoviruses, and HIV. And that's because, as I say, it gives certain properties to these viruses, which are a consequence of their fusion mechanism. So actually, given the number of envelope viruses they are, this is a very poor representation. This is a distinct minority of viruses. However, these viruses are groups which are very important clinically. So, uh, <coughs> oops. so I said a relatively few number of viruses use this method if they're envelope. What do most envelope viruses do? And... Most viruses do not fuse directly with the plasma membrane. Instead, they're taken up by some kind of endocytosis. We have various mechanisms for endocytosis. Various viruses use different mechanisms. Uh, and they don't fuse until they get inside the endosome, inside the cell. So if we look at these viruses, they again bind to a receptor on the host cell surface. But instead of fusing directly, they get taken up by an endosome. And why don't they fuse directly? And the reason they don't fuse directly is it turns out that fusion requires something on the virus to facilitate the fusion. You don't just put two membranes close together and they fuse. Otherwise, all our cells would start fusing with each other. You need something that actually facilitates fusion. So the virus in this, either the attachment protein or another protein in the virus envelope will facilitate fusion. Uh, and in the ones that I talked about, herpes, paramyxo, HIV, that fusion protein is active at neutral pH or physiological pH. Neutral pH is pH 7, of course, and physiological pH is usually about 7.4. That protein is active at that kind of pH, and therefore it will immediately facilitate fusion. For most viruses, the fusion protein is not active at physiological pH, so they don't fuse with the plasma membrane. Then they get taken up into some kind of endocytic vesicle and then they get taken into the cytoplasm and then these vesicles have got hydrogen, hydrogen ion pumps in them. So hydrogen ions are pumped into them, they become acidic. That's a part of the normal cell mechanism. Uh, these viruses are just parasitizing how we endocytose things and they take an advantage of it. So these vesicles become acidic which I've tried to show by the pink contents. And once these are acid, and it was pink, it was symbolism here, folks. Uh, once this becomes acid, this fusion protein now becomes active, and it facilitates fusion between the two membranes, just as we saw before with the herpes protein or the paramyxo protein at the cell surface. Uh, but this time it occurs inside the cell because you have to wait till it, it becomes acidified. Once it becomes acidified, something happens to change the properties of that fusion protein, its conformation, uh, and it becomes activated. You get the fusion. And now this means that the nuclear capsid is basically in continuum with the, cyc with the cytoplasm. And again, it can basically get out and then go off and do its thing. It may stay in the, new, in the cytoplasm. It may go towards the nuclear pores and deliver its contents to the nucleus. That depends on which virus you've got. Uh, and what you're left with is this endosome, which has got this viral membrane inserted into it. And if you sort of were to blow up the balloon, you just have a continuum vesicle with a patch of virus membrane on it. Uh, the question was, do endosomes get acidified because they fuse with the lysosome or because they've got their own hydrogen ion pumps? They've got their own hydrogen ion pumps. So they are already, um, are, they're already acidified before they meet the lysosome. The lysosome may be more acid, but they are already acidified. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. <clears throat> so... For the envelope viruses, there's a sort of neat mechanism. You get out of the cell by pushing through a membrane, you get the membrane, you get into a cell by fusing your membrane with a host cell membrane. It does, of course, mean that besides an attachment protein, you need to have a fusion function, which, as I say, can either be part of the attachment protein or a separate protein. 
So what you do, oh, this is just a series of EM micrographs. Um, that the trouble with an EM is it's static, but this is an attempt to reconstruct the scene of the crime. Um, so here you've got the viral particle, the envelope virus on the outside of the cell. Um, this is actually a, a, an insect-borne virus that affects man. Um, it goes into a coated pit here. So this one is going through coated pit endocytosis. You get an endosome. Here's your endosome. And eventually there will be a, a fusion and they will get out. So viruses can be taken up by endosomes. Just a question of nomenclature. Uh, you may find in some books uh, that the endocytosis is called penocytosis, taking up very small volumes. That's the normal way it's done. And the really old term was viropexis, and that's because at one stage, virologists thought viruses were special. I guess because virologists want to think virologists were special. Uh, so uh, they tended to call all these special things, these roots by special names because they thought they were something that was unique to the viruses. And as I say, more and more, we know viruses just parasitize us by and large. And viruses really don't have too many original thoughts. In fact, I'm not sure viruses have any original thoughts. So what you find is viruses look like they're doing things which are nearly neat and cute and you think they're specific to viruses. If you look hard enough in the host cell, you eventually find that we had the idea as well. We just don't use it as obviously as the viruses tend to. So any, the viruses are not being taken up by any mechanism that's unique to viruses. They're just hitching a ride on how our proteins get in from our cell surface. They bind to those proteins and get in along with them. Okay, how do non-envelope viruses get in? And this is a rather elaborate version of a black box because that's fairly close to where we are on how we get the non-envelope viruses get in. Because what you've got is a large protein-covered particle containing a really hydrophilic nucleic acid, and how is that going to get across a hydrophobic membrane? Um, and we have some ideas, but really there's nothing terribly concrete, I can tell you, so hence the black box. Um, but one thing is, we really have the same kind of argument. They, the viruses can enter, <coughs> the non-envelope viruses, some of them enter directly across the plasma membrane. They still bind to a receptor. In this case, their attachment protein is on the outside of the nuclear capsid. This is an icosahedral nuclear capsid in this case. So they bind to a receptor. Uh, and then, presume, you find the nuclear acid is in the cytoplasm. So what happens? Um, for the ones that seem to get directly across the plasma membrane, uh, it seems sometimes the nuclear capsid itself is found in the cytoplasm. And how that occurs is a mystery. Uh, and it's not even clear whether that has gone straight across the plasma membrane. We don't really know. Uh, it's very difficult to catch viruses in the app because you can only look at them in the electron microscope and you can only look at dead things in the electron microscope. So it makes it very difficult to know exactly what they do. We, we, we think we know more than we do in some ways. Uh, but some of them leave the nuclear capsid on the outside and just, the nuclear, just their genome goes into the cytoplasm, maybe with an attached protein or two. So they seem to have these two things. Um, and in this case, it's thought that if they just inject the nucleic acid, they somehow create an ion channel in the cell membrane. And then they can inject the nucleic acid through the ion channel. <coughs> um, so some of them do that. Others are taken up by endocytosis again. Um, and then nothing happens until they get acidified. So it seems that for some of them, getting across into the cytoplasm is something that you need to change the outer surface of the nuclear capsid by acidification before it can do whatever it's going to do. Um, that makes some sense. It means that they only stay, this change is going to make the nuclear capsid much more vulnerable to the environment, so it only undergoes that change once they get inside a cell. It also means that the nuclear capsid doesn't arm itself until it's actually in a living cell because the binding to the receptor is energy independent, but up being taken up by vesicles requires that you've got a living cell which has got the energy to take you up, because this is an ATP requiring process, as is the hydrogen ion pump. So when this becomes acidified, somehow or other, the nuclear capsid uh, gets across the endosome membrane. Um, and again, the mechanism for that isn't always clear. In a couple of viruses, it's 
seems that they actually break down this membrane, but other viruses, it seems somehow you find they have got across and we don't know how they got across. So there's a lot of mysteries involved with the non-enveloped viruses. But, as I say, for whether you're enveloped or enveloped, non-enveloped, you seem to have something whereby the mechanism for crossing the membrane works at neutral pH, in which case you go across the plasma membrane, or it doesn't work until you're at an acid pH, in which case you need to be taken up by endocytosis of some kind or other before you get across the membrane. Any questions? Yeah, well, this is taken up by endocytosis as well, and so as usual you get this hydrogen ion pump and it becomes acidified. I, most endocytosis methods turn out, or at least the ones that we're aware of, turn out to have some kind of acidification process involved. Well, th uh, this is natural to these things. When, once these endosomes are made, you start lowering the pH inside them. Um, and if you've got a virus inside there, it obviously just gets its pH lowered for it. It doesn't switch on the pump or anything. It's there. Okay. So I said that these viruses have got these nuclear capsids and maybe envelopes that really protect the, the genome inside that. Uh, but if you're going to replicate, basically you've got to start using that genome to make new copies of the genome. So if you're going to replicate, you really have to uncoat this enough that the genome is available to whatever parts of the cellular machinery you need it to be available to. Um, so the viruses have to uncoat. They can't keep themselves in this nice, protected, little warm environment all their lives um, because they would never manage to replicate. Um, so viruses, the, the next stage in this sort of official list of what viruses do in their replication cycle after penetration is uncoating. Now, in some cases, since penetration for envelope viruses means you lose your envelope, it fuses with the plasma membrane or with an endosome vesicle membrane, then that's already part of the uncoating. Uh, but they frequently undergo further uncoating to make the genome available. And that, the uncoating depends somewhat on the viruses. I'm going to, for many of the viruses, I'm going to briefly go through some of these phases, but I can't go through these phases with every virus. A, because you don't want to know. Um, B, because you don't want to learn it. C, because it's really, at the moment, it's not totally necessary that you do. And D, because we don't always know. So, but uncoating is important. And as we're beginning to understand some viruses' mechanisms of uncoating, again, that's a potentially weak point, because if you can stop a virus uncoating, it's not going to go anywhere. So as we're getting more sophisticated about designing tools to interfere with viral uh, replication, uh, uh, w these are targets that will eventually become available, but at the moment they're not. <clears throat> so once the uncoating occurs, they enter the eclipse phase. And as I say, the eclipse phase is when you've uncoated the virus, so it no longer has the attachment protein linked to whatever it should be linked to. If you open up this cell and extract it, you won't get any infectious material out of it. But if you were to leave that cell for another few hours, it would produce thousands of virus particles. So the virus is still there, you just can't see it, so it's called to be, it's the eclipse phase. And one thing is that seems like we're just going through nomenclature, but one thing to remember about this is you can think that somebody's got a virus, but if it's in the eclipse phase, you can't find it. So it can be difficult to find a virus, even though something is infected. Uh, so you have to remember that you, viruses can be hanging around, but if they're not producing infectious particles, they can be in this kind of eclipse type period, uh, and it can be very difficult to find them. Uh, and uh, you never know that this thing is infected. So uh, the eclipse phase has some, has explains to some extent why we've had difficulty in isolating virus from tissues that we thought were infected. And once we realize this, we can get around it in some way or other. Um, so when the, the eclipse phase technically ends with the first new virus produced uh, at the end of this, this uh, protein synthesis period and, and DNA synthesis period. So what happens is once the virus is uncoated, the nucleic acid gets replicated, the protein, new proteins get made, now you've got a pool of nucleic acid, you've got a pool of proteins, there's a self-assembly process, as they say virus assembly is, has to be relatively simple, so there's a, a self-assembly process, uh, and then you get new particles. 
first new particle, end of eclipse phase. Uh, the assembly can occur in the nucleus or in the cytoplasm or by a membrane. Um, and then the viruses uh, can undergo, you can get viruses which are assembled but are not thoroughly mature. In other words, it looks like a virus particle, but it's not yet infectious. It needs other changes for it to become infectious. And we'll talk about some of those as we go through individual life cycles. But assembly and maturation, um, some simple viruses just seem to almost just do assembly. But many of the more complicated viruses, they assemble and then they go on under maturation phase where they really pack things properly and get into the final condition that they need to infect the next cell. Um, this is just an example I gave you. Uh, this is pox virus, one of, as I say, the most complex viruses. Uh, and um, this particular one is smallpox virus. Here's the nucleus. Nothing is going on in the nucleus. Here's the cytoplasm. And these are new pox viruses assembling. And it takes new pox viruses quite a long time. They start as these sort of amorphous things and they gradually get larger. And they, this is a mature virus particle. It's sort of brick shaped. And I can see from here it's got what look like two membranes on it. This is probably also a pretty mature virus particle. So these two might be infectious. These are not. They haven't got there. So there's a long maturation process with this really complex virus. It takes about an hour, it's been determined, for it to undergo from where it first starts assembling into something that looks like a viral particle to really getting mature enough that you get some infection out of it. Question? Question? Yeah, the virus DNA is in here. Uh, the question was, do these black things have the virus DNA in? Uh, it's, you can't really see it, but um, see this kind of, there's a sort of dumbbell-shaped thing here. If you've got your laptops on or the handout, it might be easier to see it. But there's a kind of dumbbell-shaped thing here, and that's the DNA packaged with various proteins. Uh, and it takes this kind of dumbbell shape in this virus. So then you assemble the virus particles and they have to be released. And for the non-enveloped viruses, it's, we don't know of any of them that have found a way to get across a plasma membrane intact. You've got this big protein-coated nucleic acid. It's just too big to get across the plasma membrane. And we, we have no, none of them that we know that they managed to get across it. So for, if you're a non-enveloped virus, the way you standardly get out of the host cell is the host cell is now basically pretty sick. Um, and it dies for one reason or another. Sometimes it's triggered into apoptosis. Other times it just dies because it can't do anything for itself anymore and it just tails down and eventually lyses. And so in that case, all of the infectious viruses are released as the cell, or try, that's their option for release. The cell lyses, the, the virus gets out. And so everything comes at one time. You can't just release one or two viruses on a regular basis for years and years uh, because that they can't get out of the cell. Uh, with envelope viruses, they can bud through various membranes, including the plasma membrane, and, uh, and get out of the cell by budding through the plasma membrane. If they get out of the cell by passing through the plasma membrane, they don't necessarily kill the cell. They may do, but they don't necessarily. So in that case, the, cell, the infected cell can potentially, for some of these viruses, release a few viruses every day for the rest of your life. So uh, that's, a, as I say, a distinct difference between the non-enveloped and the enveloped viruses. And that's one reason why the biology of viruses can be highly affected by whether they have an envelope. Another question? Okay. Yeah. We're so the, the question was, are those viruses inside the cell, are they virions? Uh, a virion is technically the mature virus particle which is infectious. Uh, there are times when you have difficulty on, like everything when you try and classify, there are some nebulous borders. Um, but in that picture back there, just go back, almost certainly these would be infectious and therefore these are mature virions. So these would be said to be... Um, you could call these, if you want to, I guess you could call them immature virions or, or um, they're, they're normally called immature virus particles or IVPs um, because they're not infectious. Uh, so this would be the virion. Uh, and we'll be going through the life cycle of pox virus. But this would be the virion. Any other questions? 
Okay. Um, it depends for every virus particle, but one thing is, as you get these larger virus particles, I, there are lots of answers. Okay, the question is, what do you have to do to become infectious? And we'll be seeing some examples as we go through. Um, but one, one part of the answer is that for these really large virus particles, it's difficult to do self-assembly of the final virus particle. Um, you can see the kind of problem we have here. You know, this comes apart, and it's very difficult for me to put it back together again because I need some help. Uh, it's, it just falls. It doesn't self It's not terribly easy to do. What happens is for adenovirus, which um, is bigger than that, well, has more hexons than that, uh, for adenovirus, what happens is, and for herpes virus, which is another relatively big virus, they assemble a scaffold. So it's kind of like building you know, a dome on a church or something like that. You assemble a scaffold, and then you put the virion capsid on the outside, and then you have to remove the scaffold before you can put your DNA in, and then you put your DNA in, and now the outer virion is pretty leaky because you didn't tighten everything up. Now you kind of screw up all the bolts, tighten all the holes, and it comes tight and protective. Um, so you have to be able to assemble things, so you have these scaffolding type things that have to be removed. Um, you have to get your nucleic acid in, so somehow it has to have some kind of uh, opening for the DNA or the RNA to go in. And then once it's all in, you need to now close all those openings so that nothing like ribonucleases or DNases can get in. And so it, usually something then happens and the tapsid tightens up. So there's this sort of pr procedure whereby these tightening things go up. I'll show you an example with retroviruses in a minute. But it differs slightly for each virus as to exactly what happens. But does that sort of help you? Okay, looks like I, yeah. Uh, and the other thing I want to stress is with animal viruses in particular, not every release virus particle is infectious. Um, and a quite reasonable infectivity rate would be one out of 50 or one out of 100 of the viruses that come out of the cell is actually infectious. Even if, it, if they've all had time to mature and everything, they're not all infectious. We seem to make a lot of mistakes. And so viruses just produce a huge number of virus particles per cell. Um, and... They, don't, they seem to have gone for quantity versus quality. And the idea is, okay, we don't very often assemble this virus particle very accurately, so we can either you know, fire all the mechanics and, and get some better mechanics and get them to put it together properly, or we can just hope that these mechanics sometimes do a decent job. And if one in a hundred work, that's enough for us because we're going to produce 10,000, 100,000 of these things. And really, you know, as long as we in, produce several hundred, we, we've got no problems. So they just produce huge numbers of virus particles, but many of them are not infectious, it turns out. Um, so that's one thing to remember. When you, if you want to criticize virologists for not knowing about what's going on, if you look in the electron micrograph and you see all these virus particles, if only one in a hundred is infectious, how do you know that the one that's bound to the plasma membrane is going to go through the plasma membrane? I mean, you can just find all sorts of dead-end products. So it's very difficult. Uh, so by no means are all virus particles infectious, which means if you want to measure how much infectious virus you've got, you want to know how infectious is it. If you just want to know what's the total amount of virus, you can measure the total amount of virus by other techniques. So when we have techniques to measure viruses, we have to think, are they measuring live virus, which would tell us that this is infectious, or are they just measuring the total amount of virus, which doesn't tell us anything about infectivity? <coughs> But this is a, is a standard feature of the viruses that we're infected with. Um, you asked about maturation, and maybe I'll just lower the lights so I can point out on this one. Okay. So this is HIV. HIV actually matures after it buds from the cell, so it's kind of unusual in that sense. Um, so this is HIV, which is a retrovirus. Uh, it's genome associated with the proteins that's going to make the capsid, and capsid is based on a, a cosahedral capsid, uh, are actually originally look very much like donuts. So they arrive at the cell membrane, they start pushing through the cell membrane, 
And what you get are enveloped Krispy Kremes um, that push out of the cell. So this is what the virus looks like as it comes out of the cell. Um, but then what happens is that's because all of the proteins needed for the capsid are be, have been made as a, as a polyprotein, as a le proteins hooked together. And now they have to be cleaved. So they're cleaved by a protease. And when they're cleaved by a protease, now they can reassemble and to form an icosahedral nuclear capsid. I'll show you a better picture of that in the next picture. So they're not infectious until this nuclear capsid has been formed and they've undergone all these other changes that are associated with that. The protease that does that is a virally coded protease. And that was the big, one of the recent, well, not so recent now, but that was one of the big breakthroughs in HIV. Originally when HIV came out, most of the drugs were targeting the polymerase and they were nucleic acid analogs. And now we've got protease inhibitors that stop this going to this. And if this doesn't go to this, this isn't infectious. So basically those protease inhibitors that are being used for HIV treatment stop the maturation step. And if you stop the maturation step, this virus is not infectious. It's only this virus that is. Oh, oh, the question was, where is the viral protease? Um, this, if you want to think about it simplistically, it, it's almost like the rays are uh, spokes on a wheel. And it's a, there's basically a, 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 a circle of viral proteins coming out. And they've got hot, the, the proteins needed to package the RNA, um, to cleave, and are, are a part of that uh, polyprotein. It's so it's cleaved by, uh, by the protease that is itself a part of the protein. So it's a virally coded protein that contains all the proteins that are going to be needed to mature the virus and assemble this and clip this protein so that the individual proteins can go off and self-assemble. Why it does it this way, we, I don't know. I'm not sure whether there are any speculations. I've never seen a good explanation for it. Um, probably just because it's the easy way to get this out of the cell and then to do this afterwards. So it's a virally coded protease that is a part of this donut. So it's not a part of the host cell membrane, it's a part of the donut. And this just shows what the mature virus particle looks like. And this is kind of, this is an icosahedral nuclear capsid in principle, but it's kind of like somebody squashed it in the middle so it's got a bit elongated. But it's still basically uh, built on the icosahedral nuclear capsid principles. But all the proteins for this and all the proteins for that were originally a part of a precursor uh, that had to be cleaved. <coughs> so I always remember that this has got this odd one because um, it, it looks horribly like a coffin. Um, but it's basically an icosahedral nuclear capsid. So that's the mature form. Okay. So... Hmm. Is this well, I just want to go back. Okay, okay so any questions? I mean, that was just an overview. We're going to go into individual viruses, as I say. Um, one thing is I need to do some definitions again. Uh, now, viruses, virologists, when they say structural proteins, they mean all the proteins that are in that mature virion. So, for example, in the case of HIV, the protease would be a structural protein. But there's only a few molecules of protease uh, and it plays no skeletal role at all. It no, plays no support role. So the term structural is really bad, but it's used. So I have to explain it. So when you talk about structural proteins, those, that means proteins that get into the virions. So if, if you've just got one molecule of a, a reverse transcriptase or a protease or something like that in the virions, that's a structural protein. Non-structural proteins are the ones that don't get into the mature virion. So the scaffolding proteins that I talked about are non-structural proteins. They're removed. Uh, so non-structural proteins are the proteins that 
are needed for the virus in the cytoplasm, but it doesn't need to take it with it outside the cell to get into the next cell. The proteins that it takes with it are just called structural proteins, regardless of whether they've got any support role. And so uh, non-structural proteins are there, just those that are not packaged in the virion. So the definition is simple, but it isn't always intuitive. So viruses have got this life cycle attachment, penetration, replication of their DNA, making new proteins, assembly of the virus particle, maturation if necessary, getting out by either lysis or budding through the plasma membrane. Um, but what do they do to the cell? And again, I, I want to give an overview of some of this because um, this is important in terms of what the pathologist sees. Uh, and I'll try and stress it early on. Uh, so, any of these, these viruses, and each particular virus in particular cells has got its own pattern of what it does. Uh, but viruses can inhibit any of our macromolecular synthesis, DNA, RNA, or protein. So if they inhibit those, this is obviously going to have an effect on our cells. And so if they inhibit it in a particular cell, um, then that's going to knock that cell out, that cell's functions out in many cases. So that can explain some of the pathology of the, of the viruses. And so some viruses kill their cells. Other viruses do not. They don't inhibit these significantly at all. And those viruses are much more likely to persist. So if I have the choice of having a virus that knocks out a few of my skin cells versus one that becomes persistent and I have for the rest of my life because it doesn't kill my skin cells, I'd rather have the one that kills my skin cells because I can replace a few skin cells. If I've got a virus that's going to replicate in my nerve cells, in my brain, um, those are precious. I can't afford to lose one of those. Uh, and I can't replace them either. So how, we, how our cells react to the viruses can depend on basically whether our cells are disposable, in which case many are, quite often when they're infected with viruses, they'll commit apoptosis rather than act as vehicles for replication of viruses. But as I say, if they're critical cells, then frequently they, are, they do not commit apoptosis. So the details of this vary according to the virus and according to which type of cells it affects. Um, we talk about the cytopathic effect for viruses, and it, that's often abbreviated to CPE. And that's any effect that they have on these cells. So clearly, if they inhibit macromolecular synthesis, you'll see dying cells, and so cell death will be an obvious cytopathic effect. But many times, it's much more subtle than that. Basically, it's anything that we can measure, but it's widely used, of course, by pathologists because each of these viruses will tend to have rather... Um, Each virus tends to have a set of cytopathic effects that, that it, it, it has. Uh, and some of these may be relatively unique. Oh, that's a terrible, my husband would yell at relatively unique. Um, some of these may be not used by many other viruses. And some of them may be used by a lot of viruses. But basically, what you do is if you see a constellation of cytopathic effects, then you might have an idea which virus it is uh, because that particular constellation of, effect, of effects helps in the differential diagnosis as far as the pathologist is concerned. And the pathologist will also know what kind of sample he's got uh, or she's got. They will also know what, what something about the presenting symptoms in all likelihood. So they'll have an idea of given what they're seeing as cytopathic effects combined with what else they know, uh, that will help narrow down and then you can use the definitive test to prove that it's a particular virus you think it probably is. So as I say, it's any detectable change in the host cell. Each virus tends to have its own constellation of CPEs. Uh, they can be morphological changes. Um, this, I hope you can see, well, maybe we're going to need the lights down anyway, so let me. So this again is an HIV infected cell. This is an uninfected cell. And you can see the infected cell has really kind of changed its surface characteristics. Uh, and just while we're talking about it, this is a blow up of this one. This is the infected cell. And I don't know whether you can see from here, but there's lots of little bubbles here that look like little vesicles all over the cell surface. That's HIV budding out. So that gives, this keeps on budding out for a long period. So you can see the cell is just covered with these. It gives you some idea of how much virus the cell can produce, huge amounts. 
It also gives you some idea of the scale. So here, it's changed the surface properties of the cell, but it can change many other things. It can cause cell death, and as I say, frequently, we have a protective mechanism. Um, our cells sense that, the vi that they're virally infected. They know they've got lots of short bits of DNA in around, or they've got a lot of um, double-stranded RNA, which is something cells don't normally see either of those. Uh, and that will trigger apoptosis. It can be triggered by other things that viruses do to the cells. Um, and that's good for us if we can afford to lose those cells because, as I say, if the cells die before the virus replicates, then the virus doesn't go anywhere. So some viruses have actually got genes in them that prevent our cells committing apoptosis so that our cells stay long enough for them to replicate themselves. And so what happens there is if these cells are dividing cells and they don't commit apoptosis, they keep on dividing. And so what you can get is cells, if they've had apoptosis inhibited, uh, can go into an indefinite growth mode. And that can lead to benign tumors. And eventually it can lead, in some cases, to malignant tumors. Because if other changes occur in these cells which are growing indefinitely, uh, then they can become really serious problems. So some viruses tend to push cells into growth. And we'll see why in the next lecture. Um, and once they're pushed into growing, uh, if they inhibit apoptosis, which is what they often have to do to keep the cells growing, they're not intending to cause tumors per se. That probably isn't, you know, doesn't have much advantage. Uh, they just want your cell to be growing. Uh, but what happens, of course, is it takes the cell out of your control. So you can see indefinite growth or immortalization. And in some cases, those cells are not malignant. And in others, they can become malignant by acquiring mutations or other problems. So while we're talking about growth, how do we look at viruses? How do we grow viruses? Uh, we take some kind of human tissue or if other animals, according to what the virus we're interested will grow in. Um, and we digest it with enzymes, uh, and put it into some nice medium which contains all the growth factors and everything it requires. We don't really know what it requires, but it turns out if you give serum, um, either human serum or animal serum to the cells, uh, that serum tends to be very rich in all these factors, and the cells will usually grow. Some cells may require you to add extra things, uh, but you can get the Frequently, you can get cells to grow. Not all cells will start dividing if you put in tissue culture, but you hope you can get at least some out here. And by now, we have a pretty good idea of which ones we can get out and which ones we can't. And then you can put them into what's basically a plastic Petri dish. It's just slightly different from the glass Petri dishes that you see, um, A, because it's plastic, which is irrelevant, really, uh, but B, the bottom surface has been modified so that the cells will stick to it. So the cells will stick down, uh, most cells stick down, not all, but they stick down. They will start growing until they cover the whole surface of the plate. And then they usually stop growing, uh, which is a prop pro property that our cells have because uh, once they meet other cells, they stop growing, which is why your liver isn't sticking out miles ahead of you or anything. Uh, because once you get to a certain size and everything is in meets each other, it stops growing. So the cells stop growing, uh, and then if you want to keep them growing again, you use an enzyme to get them off this surface, um, dilute them with more medium, and put them, so you might take the cells from this one, and you might dilute it with more medium and put it into four or five more plates, and then grow those up until they become what's called confluent. That's when they meet each other. Uh, and once they're confluent, you can pass them again. So you can keep making more and more plates. Now, some of, some of these cells, when you take them out here, as you past them, the differentiated cells die um, or they lose their differentiated status. Uh, so as time goes on, you lose a lot of the cell types that are here early on. Uh, but it, you can eventually get some cells which will grow indefinitely. Uh, and those are often used because that's very convenient. There are tissue culture banks where you can buy these cells. There's a big one up in, near DC called the American Type Tissue Culture Collection. Um, so if any pathologist around the country or any researcher around the country wants them, they contact them. They can get these cells so that you know you're working with the same cells as the people in Seattle. And if they find that this particular virus grows on their cells, it should grow on your cells. And if you find something out with this 
it will work for them. So in the pathology lab, if you want to grow up a particular virus and you want to see whether it will infect these cells, you know it should infect the cells if it's that particular virus. If it does infect the cells, that's yet another tick in the column that it looks suspicious that you've got, you know what the virus is. So this is tissue culture of the viruses, very useful. In some cases, people have to work directly with the animals, but usually people would rather use something where they don't have to work directly with animals unless they can avoid it. Um, it's just nicer to work with things that are, uh, don't require you to kill animals all the time. And it's also much more reproducible. Um, many times you don't even do this step. As I say, you buy these immortalized cells uh, from tissue culture banks. Uh, but for some viruses, uh, they have to grow in this kind of early type of material because they require cell types that nobody has been able to make in, into a mortal cell line. Uh, but usually people uh, use this kind of thing. This just shows, if anybody wants to see them, I have a couple of these. Well, I did have. Oh, they're over here. So these are just the kind of things that you grow the cells in. So here's one. Well, that's even worse. <clears throat> well, we have these plates here, uh, and they're just, you can put the cells in there, keep them sterile, and they will grow on these. Bottles are the same, they're just a bit more useful because you can screw the caps on and not spill them, and you're taking them over to grow them. So you grow them in a, an incubator, uh, and it's fairly straightforward. Um, so how do we use these? Oh, sorry. You can't see what I see. Okay. Okay, so here are some epithelial cells. They look like nice cobblestone paving type of stuff. Um, frequently when you put epithelial cells in culture, um, they don't look quite as nice as this, and they're said to be epithelioid. And you can also get these elongated fibroblast type cells. So these are two cell types that are frequently used to look at viruses. Don't memorize this. I'm just trying to show you how we look at viruses. Um, so here are epithelial cells infected with an adenovirus. Early in infection, they're rounding up. That's, these are floating cells. They're basically dead. They, they can't stick anymore because of what adeno has done to them. And eventually, it starts lysing them. It's a non-envelope virus. It gets out by lysis. And so you, you lose a lot of cells because they've just popped and disappeared. Here is respiratory syncytial virus, and I would know that it's a syncytial virus because here these cells, have co it's caused fusion of all of these cells. And we'll come back to why these do, but the, the viruses that fuse with plasma membranes tend to cause these syncytia. Uh, so these are cells where the, the plasma membranes have fused together, and the nuclear membranes have not. So it's got, it's got however many nuclei correspond to however many cells were fused. Um, so this is obviously a very different appearance. So these are the kind of things that give the clue to the uh, clinical virologist as to what's going on. Um, here are fibroblastic cells infected with herpes simplex. And again, um, you can start to see cells rounding up here. By here, cells have rounded up. It also does cause lysis, even though it's a membrane virus. And down here, there's some fusion going on because it's one of the fusing viruses as well. Um, so... If you know what type of cell you've got and you see these kinds of things, then you know that some viruses will do this to fibroblasts but not epithelial cells or vice versa. So you start having quite a few clues. Here's polio virus and it just blows the cells apart on fibroblasts in this case. So how can we look at how, how infectious virus is um, without killing a lot of animals? Uh, and one way we do it is something called plaque assay. So if we have, this is meant to be those cobblestone epithelial cells in this case. So if we've got these cells growing in tissue culture and we infect with a very dilute solution of virus, maybe one of these cells will get infected and not the rest of them. 
So if we're doing this in real life, we make a series of dilutions so that we get one dilution that will do this kind of thing. So the rest of these cells will be uninfected. Now, you can't see this infected cell, not unless you've got really good eyesight. Um, but the virus will replicate, and it will grow, and it will lyse that cell in this particular case, or kill it in some way or other, and then it, can inf it will infect the surrounding cells. And when it infects those, it will kill those eventually, and then it will carry on. So what will happen is that original virus particle can make a big hole in this cell confluent monolayer that you originally started with. In fact, what we do is we put a bit of stuff like agar into the medium to stop the virus diffusing around so that it stays where it started. Um, and the medium is what is basically the, the liquid that we put on top to feed the cell. Uh, so in this case, we would have a hole. And we know that the hole was due to one infectious virus particle. Uh, so the, we don't care about how many numbers we have now. All we are doing is we're leaving the hole enough time to grow so that we can see it. So every hole that grew started off from an infectious virus particle because the non-infectious virus particles wouldn't have been able to grow and wouldn't cause a hole. So what does this look like in real life? Okay. So here we have a real... Okay. So here are these holes, and on this particular plate, uh, there are six of these wells, and these would be done in duplicate. So you can see these holes. Each one started from an infectious virus particle. We know what volume of liquid we put on, and we know how much diluted it was. Uh, as we do the series of dilutions, these are tenfold dilutions. There are too many to count here. They're overlapping each other, and it would drive you nuts to count them. Uh, but here, you can count these. So we could count how many infectious virus particles there were. It's that simple. What we did here is we removed the medium and we actually added a stain that would stain the cytoplasm of live cells. So it makes these holes easier to see. So the red is actually due to a stain. Um, and so if we know that we added 0.1 mils of, vi of virus that was diluted 100 times here, if there are, say, 30 plaques on here, we know if it was 0.1 of a mil, there were 300 plaques in a mil. And if it was delivered, diluted 100 times, that means that we've got 300 times 100 infectious virus particles in a mil. So it's really a very simple way to do it. The next dilution will be so dilute that we don't really have many plaques. There's none on that. There's three on this. Okay. Yeah, the question? Uh, just that we know how long to leave them in order to take them off. So yeah, if eventually it would just kill the whole plate. So we know how long to leave them such that they're big enough to see easily, but they haven't killed the whole plate. Sorry, the question was, what stops them growing more? The, the, what stops them is we had to remove the medium and stain them. So that's, that stops them in their tracks wherever they got to. Okay. And so what we would call each of those infectious units, I said it's difficult talking about life or death when you come to viruses. So each of those infectious units uh, we call a plaque-forming unit. So I wouldn't say that we had 30,000 infectious virus particles. Well, I might, but that's a bit slangy, because you might say, well, how did you determine that? If I say we have 30,000 PFU, you know that I did it by a plaque assay, which is what this is called, because the little holes are called plaques. Uh, so plaque-forming unit, what it means is, and in, in this case, an infectious virus particle is defined as a particle which could form a plaque. So we just say we've got 10 platforming units, 100 platforming units, whatever. So if you see this phrase, platforming units, it means how many infectious particles you've got, and it means that you measured them by this kind of assay. Any problem? Okay. Then the DNA handout sheets are here. We'll, we'll talk about the DNA viruses tomorrow. I know I'm not sticking rigidly to the schedule. Um, we never do with these lectures. Uh, so... We'll, pick, we'll start the DNA viruses tomorrow. Thank you.